In the early hours of October the 4th, 2009, 42-year-old Kimberly Cates was in bed asleep with her 11-year-old daughter Jamie at their home in the town of Mount Vernon in the state of New Hampshire in the United States. This was a place where both should have been safe and secure. Little did they know the four depraved young men had chosen their home to break into and they were intending to kill everyone present as an initiation into a club called the Disciples of Destruction, created by the leader of the group, 17-year-old Stephen Spader. Spader later described himself as, quote, the most sick and twisted person you'll ever meet. Spader and his right-hand man, 19-year-old Christopher Gribble, attacked Kimberly and Jamie. Kimberly was hacked to death with a machete, and Jamie was brutally attacked, but despite suffering horrific injuries, she survived. The group were arrested almost immediately, and the nation was shocked by the age of the perpetrators, the savagery of their crimes, and their utter remorselessness. Welcome to Evil Among Us. The leader of the murderous group responsible for this horrific incident was Stephen Spader, who was born on the 9th of November 1991 in Arizona. Spader was adopted at the age of five days old by Stephen and Christine Spader due to his mother being unable to take care of him to her issues with drugs. In fact, Spader was found to have cannabis and cocaine in his system on the day of his birth. He was raised in a three-bedroom colonial house in the quiet town of Brookline in New Hampshire, a state in the northeastern United States. From court records, it seems as though Stephen and Christine gave everything they could to their son, and initially, he seemed like a happy child. In school, Spader was initially described as funny and kind, and also potentially a talented actor, with him getting involved in school plays, including landing the role of Daddy Warbucks in a school production of Annie. He was also part of the Boy Scouts. However, subtle concerns related to this case began when he was in primary school. Spader was obsessed with attention and would do anything to get his classmates to notice him. He seemed unable to function unless all eyes were on him. When he was around 14 or 15 years old, Spader's demeanour changed entirely. He was struggling academically and he was becoming more isolated. He was a little fish in a big pond at high school, and his class clown antics, which had made him popular when he was younger, were now considered irritating. Despite wanting to be included, one of the cool kids, Spader was struggling to fit in and was becoming more angry. It was clear he was desperate for a connection with others, and he would lie and manipulate those around him, telling fantastic or tragic stories in order to gain attention and sympathy to keep them as his friends. However, when they discovered his lies, people distanced themselves from him. As well as his difficulties in school, there were increasing tensions within the family home due to Stephen and Christine trying to motivate their son to do his schoolwork and him simply refusing to do so. With the popular kids rejecting him, Spader began to look for marginalised groups to be part of. At one point, he shaved his head and began hanging out with a group of skinheads. The group would stand around parts of the school, dressed all in black, staring at anyone who came into their area. A former classmate said that because of their demeanour, quote, no one wanted them, but no one would mess with them, and everyone would give the group a wide berth. Due to her son's behaviour becoming more problematic, Christine got Spader assessed by a psychologist in 2017 when he was 16 years old, and the report produced stated that he exhibited, quote, an unstable sense of self, deepening isolation, and a disinclination to restrain his impulses. It's clear that Spader was defining himself more and more by being a teenager on the fringes of society, and he soon adopted a gangster persona and styled himself as an outlaw. Rules didn't apply to him, and he became more disruptive in school. The classmates who commented before also reported that Spader, quote, said whatever he wanted. He didn't care what the principal said. They'd tell him to go to class. He wouldn't. They'd suspend him. He didn't care. Authority was nothing to him. Stephen Spader changed from a polite and sweet child into a school bully who began to openly brag about how he wanted to kill total strangers just for the thrill of watching them die, as well as claiming that he was part of a violent street gang. Spader also became obsessed with weapons and on at least one occasion threatened his father with a blade and stabbed the work surfaces at home with a kitchen knife. Christine tried desperately to get help for her son, including sending him to out-of-state retreats for problem teens and in 2008, the year before the murder, she had him committed to a psychiatric hospital 
on two separate occasions, but he only spent a few days there before being discharged. By the age of 17 years old, Stephen Spade was a young man who had completely rejected society and was noticeably having frequent and intense homicidal thoughts. He was also obsessed with infamy and was determined to form a group with him as the leader whose sole focus was to kill others, to fulfill his sick fantasies and get the attention and feelings of power he desperately craved. And so he began recruiting others to his cause. Second in command of the group was Christopher Gribble, who was born on October the 18th, 1989, and was raised, like Stephen Spader, in the town of Brookline. The referring account of his upbringing, what appears to be true, is that Gribble grew up in a devout Christian household with his mother Tamara and his father Richard Gribble. He was homeschooled for much of his childhood, but it appears he did participate in activities with other children, including the Boy Scouts and Dungeons and Dragons clubs. However, Gribble had significant social difficulties. He struggled to pick up on conversational cues and would continue speaking long after it was clear that people wanted the conversation to end. He would also talk at length about his interests, including the military, and would often be seen walking around town in camo clothing. Because of how he acted, children would avoid him, and he became labelled as weird and a dork, meaning that he too began moving more and more towards the fringes of society. In a later interview with the psychiatrist during the court proceedings, Gribble claimed that he had been abused throughout his childhood, especially by his mother Tamara, who he said would pin him down and pop acne and other sores on his back, telling him not to move while she did this. Tamara did admit in court that there was one instance when her son was five years old when she beat him on the bottom with a wooden spoon, but this was due to an incident where, instead of coming inside to use the bathroom, he wet himself and carried on playing. This was something he'd apparently done on several occasions, resulting in his clothes and shoes being ruined, so Tamara felt the only way he would listen was if she hit him with the spoon. Aside from this incident, the extent of the abuse described by Gribble is refuted by his family. As a teenager, his behaviour became more problematic. He began displaying narcissistic and grandiose behaviour. Gribble was a practised liar who would twist any situation into him being the victor or the one in the right. He appeared to have no ability to acknowledge any fault in the way he acted. He also showed a worrying lack of empathy for anyone else and was entirely self-absorbed. There are reports that Gribble also began abusing animals around this same age, but the extent of this is not clear. At the age of 16, Christopher Gribble groped a member of the church congregation and his family were told they needed to get their son help, and so he began seeing a therapist. However, Gribble was not interested in changing. He used this forum as a way to boast about himself and tried to manipulate his therapist. His father Richard later recalled, quote, He seemed to think he could tell them whatever he wanted and convince them of whatever he wanted them to believe. It was to his therapist that Gribble expressed his hatred of his mother and that he wanted her to drop dead and, on other occasions, that he wanted to kill her. Tamara later stated that the therapist her son had disclosed this to called her to inform her in line with state law, but minimised the seriousness of the threat stating it was akin to a teenager having a tantrum. However, the therapist was clearly wrong, and after his arrest, Christopher Gribble would admit that, as well as wanting to kill his mother, he'd had fantasies about murdering people for years. Gribble originally met Spader when they were children and attended scouts together. It appears they had contact with each other over the years, but only reconnected properly around six months before the murder of Kimberly Cates. It's clear they fed off each other, their shared desire for notoriety their love of violence, their rejection of society, and their total lack of empathy for others, and they soon began planning acts of extreme violence towards complete strangers. Further recruits included William Marks, who was born on August 30th, 1991. Marks was noted in media reports for his short stature, standing at around five foot four inches tall, and his baby-faced appearance, and it seems that these features have been the reason why he was bullied as a teenager and had developed significant issues with his self-esteem. Marx once excelled at baseball, but retreated from the sport by age 13, and was soon completely isolated, with few friends, with him spending most of his time in his room playing video games. By the time of the murder, when he was 18 years old, he was hanging around with the wrong crowd, including other people who perceived themselves to have been rejected by mainstream society, and this included Stephen Spader. How the pair met specifically is unclear, but Marx looked up to Spader, 
their friendship was based on the fact that he thought, quote, he was a giant kid who was going to have his back. Lastly, there was Quinn Glover, born in 1991. There's little information about Glover, apart from the fact that he was brought up in the town of Amherst, the same place where William Marks lived, and, according to families who knew him, he was, quote, headed down a dark path. I think it can be assumed that he, like his co-defendants, felt marginalised and was also a very angry young man. So Stephen Spader now had his minions, and he sought to escalate things quickly to realise his fantasies of murder and mayhem. The group had been hanging out for just a matter of months, and in September 2009, Stephen Spader decided to name his gang of misfits, and he dubbed them the Disciples of Destruction, or DOD. Spader created rules for the gang, and a hierarchy with himself at the top, Christopher Gribble as his second in command, and William Marks and Quinn Glover as lieutenants. The rules of the gang appeared cult-like, with reverence being paid to Spader, as well as his orders being followed without question at all times. Dissent was not acceptable, even the group was not an option, and absolute secrecy was required at all times. The main purpose of the gang was to kill, to cause as much destruction as possible, just for the adrenaline rush, the sheer thrill of it. In a note that was sent by Spader to another inmate after the murder, he explained his rationale for starting the Disciples of Destruction, with him stating that all three of his co-defendants, quote, knew that I've been about bodies, and all three wanted to kill someone. Personally, I was considering starting a crew, not a gang, but a group of like-minded individuals with the balls to do crazy shit. I didn't want pussies, or people who just talk the talk, dig? So I set this up to see if my homies could be about it. The gang planned to kill those in the course of home invasions. They would also take property to fund further criminality. In the weeks leading up to the attack, Stephen Spade was talking about turning his violent fantasies into reality. Always by his side, nodding along, was his second-in-command, Christopher Gribble. Neither Marks or Glover showed any concern for what they were getting involved in, or raised any objection to killing another human being. Another teenager would end up in the dock, with the four main offenders. This was 20-year-old Autumn Savoy. It appears he was not officially a part of the gang, but was someone that Stephen Spader felt confident in helping him plan and cover up his crimes. He would later testify in court about Spader's deranged rants, including him claiming that he'd killed twice before. In September 2009, William Marks and Stephen Spader began driving around the area and decided that the rural town of Mont Vernon, which lies around 12 miles north of Brookline, would be a perfect place to begin their campaign of terror. This was a town of less than 2,000 residents and the isolated location was considered ideal by Spader. The gang would be less likely to be disturbed and if police were called, they would have ample time to flee the area. Within the town, one particular street was chosen, Troy Road as there were a number of properties which Spader felt it would be easy to break into. It's been reported that one house was chosen, but this was decided to be unsuitable, as there was no easy way to get in, and also the property was too big to effectively search. And so number four was chosen, and this was the home of the Cates family, Kimberly, Jamie, and David. Kimberly Cates was born on March 6th, 1967, in Toledo, in the state of Ohio. Kimberly devoted her life to helping others and was a paediatric nurse who initially worked at Tucson Medical Center before meeting David Cates and they got married in 1997. A year later, they welcomed their daughter Jamie into the world. The family then lived in Baltimore, Maryland, before eventually relocating to Mount Vernon and moving into Four Troy Road, their dream home. They moved to the area because of the quiet and tranquil surroundings this was somewhere they thought it would be safe for Jamie to grow up. Kimberly has been described as a loving wife and mother, with her and Jamie being described as best friends. She was also described as someone who was utterly devoted to the children in her care. David worked for the company BAE Systems as an engineer and would often travel out of town, sometimes upwards of 26 times a year, meaning that Kimberly and Jamie were often in the home alone, and during these times, Jamie would often snuggle into bed with her mother in the master bedroom at the back of the house. The Cates felt safe in their home. They had a security system and an arrangement with neighbours to watch out for each other. The family could have had no idea that they'd been targeted by a homicidal gang of thugs who were intent on wreaking havoc, mayhem and murder 
all to get their sick kicks. Stephen Spade had decided that the group would break into Fort Troy Road in the early hours of Sunday, October the 4th, 2009. I've no doubt this was not an arbitrary decision. I believe that Spade and his co-defendants had likely been watching the property for some time and were fully aware of the routine of the household. They knew that David Cates was away in Maryland on a work trip that weekend and that Kimberly, aged 42, and 11-year-old Jamie were there alone and completely defenceless. The day before the attack, the final details were being arranged. Showing the absolute depravity of Stephen Spader, he didn't just want to kill people, he wanted to drug the residents of the house, drive them to a separate location, and then torture them into giving up their bank details and the location of valuables before killing them. Prosecutors later recovered evidence that less than 24 hours before the murder, using his own and Alton Savoy's computer, Spader was researching instructions on how to make chloroform. He found a list of necessary ingredients and sent the instructions and the list to Christopher Gribble and tasked him with making this powerful anaesthetic to subdue their victims. However, this plan was abandoned when he couldn't obtain all the items. Whilst talking to Savoy, Spader revealed that he'd lined up a quote, job, which would act as an initiation ritual into the Disciples of Destruction. Text messages were recovered between Spader and Gribble, discussing what was about to happen and what they needed to bring with them. They spoke in code, referring to their plan to murder as going to a party. At 10.27pm, around five hours before the murder, Gribble texts Spader saying, quote, Ought to be a good party. Remind me to show you the new pocket knife I picked up from a friend. Half an hour later, Spader sent a message back to Gribble, telling him to bring garbage bags as they, quote, needed them to clean up after. Both William Marks and Quinn Glover were contacted and they were told they were going to break into a property and kill the occupants. This would confirm them as members of the group. And so, in the early hours of Sunday, October the 4th, 2009, Stephen Spader, Quinn Glover and William Marks got into Christopher Gribble's truck, which had already been loaded with their murder kit. This included a machete, a pocket knife, an axe, garbage bags, a shovel, and rope. They then drove to Mont Vernon, and Gribble dropped the other three off on the driveway of Fort Troy Road at around 2.30 a.m. whilst he went to park his vehicle. In the half an hour this took, Spader, armed with a machete, Glover and Marks were looking for a way into the house. During this time, Kimberly and Jamie Cates were completely unaware of the danger approaching. They'd been asleep since around 8.30 p.m. the night before, with Jamie curled up in her mother's arms in the master bedroom. The group identified a basement window, which was barely open, and the only person who could fit in was William Marks, and he was the first to enter the house. Marks found himself in the basement and went to the door leading into the main house. He pushed on the door and convinced himself it was locked when all he had to do was pull it. He panicked and whispered to the others that he was locked in the basement, so they looked for another way in. By this point, Christopher Gribble, who had a pocket knife tucked into his trousers, had returned and the rest of the group quickly found another point of entry into the home. This was a living room window which had an air conditioning unit in it. Using the knife, they cut the screen surrounding the unit, removed it, and climbed in through the living room window. All four were now in the property, and after rescuing Marks from the basement, they proceeded through the house. Unfortunately, the alarm system wasn't working on this date. At the front of the house, Gribble cut the power by flipping the breaker switch, and all four then proceeded towards the back of the property. The first room they entered was Jamie's room, which they searched and found empty, but one of them picked up an iPod and used the light to guide their way through the house. The next room they came to was the master bedroom, where Jamie and Kimberly were asleep. This was at around 3am, just moments before the horrific attack. There are varying accounts of what happened next. According to Christopher Gribble, in his latest confession, the four thought, due to the darkness, the room was empty, and so began talking amongst themselves. They then heard Kimberly rouse and speak, and then realised someone was in the room, and the attack began. We're going to play a clip from Gribble's testimony on the stand during his trial, giving his account. Then I'll talk about what it seems actually happened. He opened the door a little bit, and shined it in and looked in. And he said something, which to us, I mean, Quinn and, and Billy seemed to agree with me. 
um, that it sounded like he said, no one's here. And so we were like, oh, okay. And so we started talking a little bit. We like, oh, well, this is, you know, all this worry for nothing. And, uh, and then he turned around and was like, shh, shh, there's somebody there. And he opened the door a little bit uh, wider. I think it was at that point that Mrs. Cates woke, woke up. Um, I couldn't see too well into the room. I generally have reasonable night vision, but I mean, the iPod was right there ruining my vision. Um, I remember seeing like some form sit up on what was to me the left side of the bed. Um, as you were facing it from the foot. Yes, as I'm as you're facing it from the hallway. It was it was the left. Um, and uh, a, a female voice said uh, some, something like, Jamie, is that you? Um, at that point, I don't remember thinking anything for a little while. Um, it got really weird. And I'm going to have a little trouble describing it because I've never felt that way before. Um, but Steve immediately tossed the iPod and went down on the floor. Um, and headed for the right-hand side of the bed. The next thing I knew, I was walking towards the other side of the bed. I don't remember thinking, I should go over to the other side. It was just like I knew without having to consider what I should do. Um, and uh, I don't remember when I pulled the knife out from the sheath. Uh, at some point it was in my hand. I don't remember when I pulled it out. I remember realizing that it was in my hand, but I don't remember pulling it out. Um, and I went to the other side, and by the time I got to that side of the bed, um, I remember the, the girl woke up on the right-hand side of the bed. Um, I don't remember exactly what she said. I remember the feeling that she was groggy. But that's all I really remember about it. Uh, she might have said something like, like, uh, mommy or something like that. Um, and then Steve just started hacking at the bed. I, mean, I don't know that he could see what he was doing, but I could tell he was quacking at the bed because I, I could hear it thumping against the, the, the blankets and everything. Um, I remember someone started screaming. Um, and at one point I heard like a um, and then some of the screaming stopped and uh, not long after that I kind of reached in and stabbed at the form in front of me I, I knew what I was stabbing at but I can't tell you how because I couldn't really see well it but I knew where it was. Um, I can't explain how I even actually hit what I was stabbing at. Were you stabbing the person at the same time that Steve was hacking? Oh, he, was, he never stopped. It, he just kept going and going and going. It, it's not like he, he stopped in between. I just reached in. So you um, were doing it at the same time that he was hacking with Yes. Friend. Um, but you were managing not to get hit with a machete as he was doing that. Yeah, looking back on that, I don't know how I pulled that off. Um. Much has been made of Gribble's comment about Kimberly waking up and asking, is that you, Jamie? However, listen to the way that Gribble phrases his actions. Essentially, he reacted with shock when he realized someone was in the room. Spader began swinging the machete. I just stabbed at shadows. I didn't know what I was doing. This is bullshit. And his ridiculous narrative has fed into some news articles, which made some truly bizarre statements, including one which says, quote, Thinking that the coast was clear, the boys began to relax and talk louder, as they thought they'd been lucky enough to choose an empty home to burglarise. This misses the whole point. These men were there to kill, not steal. If they could take items, then that would be a happy bonus, but they were there to live out their fantasies of murder. What actually happened likely comes from Jamie herself, she later stated that she and her mother woke up when they heard a noise. Kimberly then got up and approached the open bedroom door. When out of the gloom a man stepped forward holding a machete, Stephen Spader, who violently pushed her back on the bed before being followed into the room by another man, Christopher Gribble, and the attack began. 
both Queen Glover and William Marks were not involved in the attack, but stood in the doorway watching, doing nothing to stop the horror that was unfolding. There's a simple reason for this. They didn't want to. As to the claim they couldn't see anything, this is a lie. It was dark but not pitch black. Whether this was due to light from the iPod or some other light source is unclear, but Jamie was able to accurately describe Spader and Gribble's clothing after the fact. If she could see them, it stands to reason they could see her. They knew who they were attacking, and this is also shown by the nature of the injuries suffered, especially in the case of Kimberly, which were targeted and truly horrific. Whilst on the bed, Kimberly received at least 32 injuries, most of these inflicted with the machete, which Stephen Spader brought down again and again with all of his might. Most of these blows were aimed at Kimberly's head and torso, and resulted in her head being split open. The coroner later stated that her brain would have been visible through the wounds in her head to those witnessing the attack. The force of the blows also dislodged one of Kimberly's eyes, which hung from the socket. Other blows pierced her organs and shattered bones. Kimberly also had stab and slash wounds inflicted by Gribble. Horrifyingly, Kimberly was still alive, but unconscious after the attack. This was noticed by Spader as she was making goadly noises. He told Gribble to quote, finish them off. He obliged and stabbed Kimberly in the throat three times as she eventually bled to death. Jamie was also attacked, with Gribble attempting to stab her in the heart twice. Both times he missed, but the wounds came within centimetres of causing injuries which would have inevitably killed her. As Gribble used the knife to stab Jamie, Spader also attacked her with the machete. He brought this weapon down on her head with so much force that it lacerated her face and broke her jaw. Further blows included one to the back of Jamie's head which fractured her skull, another which broke her arm and one which severed part of her left foot. Christopher Gribble then picked up Jamie and threw her across the room, sending her crashing into a sliding glass door which shattered. Jamie then showed amazing bravery and intelligence. She lay still and played dead, knowing this was likely the only way that she would potentially escape with her life. And this worked. Gribble later told investigators that he thought she was dead because, quote, the little girl wasn't moving at all, so I figured she was toast. At some point during the assault, power was restored and the lights turned on, with Gribble stating the room where Kimberly and Jamie were attacked looked like, quote, something from the show CSI, and he described Spade's appearance as being like Jason from Halloween, covered in blood and holding the machete. The four monsters then took some valuables from the home and left. Jamie stayed motionless, frozen to the spot for around 30 minutes, lightly in indescribable pain from the 18 wounds she'd suffered. Around 4am, she dragged herself to the phone and dialed 911. The call was played in court. You can barely hear Jamie whimpering in pain and then she said, quote, they robbed my house before the line went dead. Police traced the call and they were dispatched and they arrived at the scene of absolute horror. I want to play a news clip which includes officers' testimony in court about what they saw. saw a, a young girl laying on the floor. Um, I observed that she was completely covered in blood from her head to her toe. Uh, I observed that she had major injuries and major trauma to include lacerations to her face, extremities, um, as well as I observed that part of her foot was, was missing. Sergeant Furlong says Jamie was trying to scream, but nothing was coming out of her mouth. I got close to her. Um, I told her that I was a police officer, I was there to help. Um, she then said in a whisper while shaping, shaking that she thought her mommy was dead. I asked her how this happened, and she said that there was a guy in the house. Uh, she said that there was guys in the house, one of them had a knife, and the other one had a bat, and he hit my mom. Kimberly Cates' mutilated body was found on the bed where she'd been attacked, and she was declared dead at the scene. Jamie was rushed in critical condition to Nashua Hospital, then transferred to Boston Children's Hospital. She spent months undergoing a number of gruelling and painful operations to treat her injuries. She also had to have skin grafts, including to her foot, so she could walk again. Jamie's will to survive and her strength and courage are truly remarkable and something we'll return to later. Back to the scene, officers were gathering evidence and a murder investigation was begun. And less than 48 hours later, those responsible would be in custody. 
immediately after murdering Kimberly Cates and attempted to murder Jamie, Stephen Spader was described as being, quote, euphoric and excited. He and Christopher Gribble then went to the home of Autumn Savoy, with both bragging that they'd just killed two people. Savoy was shown the blood-covered murder weapons and could see hair clinging to the blade of the machete. Savoy had agreed to help the group get away with their crime and give them an alibi, and he threw their bloody clothing in the river. The three then sat watching a TV show about a fictional serial killer, and during this, Spader continued bragging about what he'd done, describing Jamie trying to protect her mother and how Gribble had stabbed her and he had hacked at her with a machete. Savoy then went online to look for news reports about the crime, but found out that Jamie had survived. He informed the pair of this and said to Gribble, quote, You're an idiot because you can't even kill a fifth grader. This was obviously meant to be a joke and highlights that while Savoy was not involved in the actual attack, he was just as sick and twisted as those who were. When they were informed of this news, Spader and Gribble were upset and became depressed. They felt they'd failed. They wanted to kill two people. The group, especially Spader and Gribble, could not help but boast about what they'd done. They would tell everyone and anyone around town. One of their teenage friends then told their parents, who called the police. Just before midday on Monday, October the 5th, 2009, the day after the murder, an unmarked patrol car containing detectives from the New Hampshire State Police Major Crime Unit pulled up outside the home of Stephen Spader at 7 Wallace Brook Road in Brookline. As they arrived, Stephen Spader, Christopher Gribble and Autumn Savoy were coming out of the house. Gribble was dressed in camouflage clothing and had four pocket knives on him. They were not initially arrested, but were instead asked to come in for questioning. Neither Gribble or Spader showed any sign of distress or fear. In fact, Gribble had a smile plastered on his face and happily handed over the knives he was carrying and said he was happy to talk to detectives. In short order, William Marks and Quinn Glover were also brought in for questioning. Each member of the group was interrogated for hours. Christopher Gribble initially denied any involvement and tried to cover for Spader. In fact, he described himself as a quote, gentleman whose moral code would never allow him to harm a woman, let alone a child. He claimed to be appalled at the idea that someone could inflict this level of violence upon anyone, especially an 11 year old child. When he was informed that Jamie was alive and could identify her attackers, he pretended to be thrilled at the news. He told detectives, quote, I didn't do anything. Steve was with me. We didn't do anything wrong. If you have evidence against that, then use it, instead of just trying to make me change my story. When asked what he thought should happen to the men responsible for this, he said, quote, I would say they should at least go to prison for the rest of their lives. If the jury decides the death penalty, I probably wouldn't disagree with that. He also said, it really goes against me to harm a woman in general, but a little girl, that's like, how could you do that to someone that young? Eventually, Gribble broke and confessed his and Spader's involvement. He was completely motionless and had no remorse for his crimes. With regards to Jamie, he said the following, quote, I'm kind of surprised she's alive. If I realised she was still alive, I would have ended it for her. And I kind of wish she'd died for her sake, just because she's going to have to live with all that now. So this monster thinks that him killing this child would have been an act of mercy. Gribble's confession was likely triggered by the fact that others were talking, and this included Orson Savoy, who initially tried to give a false alibi for Gribble and Spader, saying they were at his house at the material time, before confirming this was a lie and admitting that he'd helped them dispose of evidence after the murder. William Marks also confessed his role in the crime. As for Stephen Spader, he played dumb, but quickly dropped this when told by detectives others were talking, and he gave a full and graphic confession. Detectives stated that he, quote, told his story with a sense of accomplishment that only those who kill with ease are capable of understanding. Eventually, all of those involved were charged. Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble were both charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and attempted murder. Quinn Glover was charged with burglary, robbery, and conspiracy to commit burglary. William Marks was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, burglary, and first-degree assault. Autumn Savoy was charged with hindering apprehension and conspiracy to commit burglary. All five were remanded into custody to await their day in court. William Marks, Autumn Savoy, and Quinn Glover reached deals with the prosecutor where they would plead guilty to their charges and testify against Stephen Spader 
in exchange for lighter sentences. Despite his confession, Spader pleaded not guilty to all charges, as did Gribble. With regards to Gribble, he didn't retract his confession, but instead claimed he was not guilty by reason of insanity. His trial was held separately. Stephen Spader's trial began on October the 25th, 2010, at the County Superior Court in Nashua. At the court, the true evil and remorselessness of those involved in this crime was laid bare. William Marks had been recorded in phone conversations, talking to his father about selling details of the murder to the media to make money. He also wrote a poem whilst in prison about wanting to dismember women, which included the line, quote, I always have an axe by my side, looking for my next homicide. With regards to Spader, his own words came back to bite him. He had bragged to multiple other inmates about his crimes, both verbally and in writing. He wrote multiple letters to inmates in prison, some of which were turned over to the prosecutor. One ten-page letter, written to a fellow con, began with the line, quote, So begins the tale of the Mont Vernon murder by Stephen A. Spader. Anyone else think the letter A likely stands for arsehole? In the document, Spader wrote in graphic detail about hacking at Kimberly Cates with the machete and seeing her brains through her skull and her eye popping out of her socket. He described the attack as, quote, an adrenaline rush. I almost hit Gribble with machete. He said I looked crazy. He continued writing, the little girl screamed and jumped into Gribble, who stabbed and sliced her head, face, chest, then threw her into the glass door, as well as saying, I hacked up the mum. He also wrote a note, which began with the line, quote, I'm probably the most sick and twisted person you'll ever meet. As well as this, it transpired that Stephen Spader had written a letter to the Nashua Telegraph in March 2010, complaining that they'd spelt his first name wrong in various articles. Clearly he was spending all of his time going through news articles, getting off on his notoriety. The jury saw Stephen Spader for what he is, a remorseless killer, and on the 9th of November 2010, he was convicted on all counts. For the murder of Kimberly Cates and the attempted murder of Jamie Cates, Stephen Spader was sentenced to life imprisonment with no chance of parole. As for the others, William Marks was sentenced to between 30 and 60 years in prison. Quinn Glover was sent to prison for between 20 and 40 years. And Autumn Savoy was sentenced to between 5 and 12 years in prison. He was paroled in 2015. The rest remained behind bars. Christopher Gribble's trial began in February 2011. His argument, as I said, was that he committed the crimes that he'd been charged with, but was suffering from some underlying mental illness, which meant that he was not fully responsible for his actions. I've played a small part of his testimony already, but want to play a further short clip of this monster, for several reasons, one of which will become clear soon. But for now, just look at his smugness. He's reveling in the attention. You're a dangerous guy, right? I could be considered dangerous, yes. You actually told Dr. Yurtinus about a month ago that the people in the jail have no idea how dangerous you are. No, they don't. Is that one of those times when you did that smile? Is that one of those times when you can kind of fake your body language? No. No, I smile because it's funny that all the people in there have no idea who they're messing with. They may not, but you'd agree the Cates family certainly knows how dangerous you are, right? Well, yes. You made sure of that, right? Made sure of it, yes. I guess you could say that. However, a forensic psychiatrist who assessed Gribble said that whilst he displayed signs of personality disorder, he was not suffering from any delusional disorder, that he knew right from wrong, and was completely in control of his actions. The jury also saw through Gribble's lies, and he was convicted on all charges. And so, like Spader, Christopher Gribble was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. Because of the Supreme Court's ruling of the sentencing of minors to life sentences, Stephen Spader was granted a new sentencing hearing as he was just 17 years old at the time of his crimes. I assume this would have given him some hope of parole in the future. However, on the 22nd of April 2013, Spader didn't attend court and waived his right to a new sentencing hearing. Instead, a letter was read out on his behalf by his lawyers, which stated, quote, Through my impulsive actions, I've torn apart families and ruined lives. I'm truly sorry for the pain I've caused you, 
I do not expect forgiveness, nor do I deserve any. David and Jamie Cates were appalled by this insincere apology, especially given the fact that it was disclosed that in December 2012, Spader had spoken to prison staff and reiterated that he had no remorse for his actions and in fact considered empathy a weakness. Remember Christopher Gribble claiming he was the big man and the people in prison could not see how dangerous he was? Well, his new friends in New Hampshire State Prison for Men saw him for the weak, pathetic piece of shit he was and he was victimised and assaulted repeatedly after he was sentenced, meaning he had to be moved to a special protected housing unit for his own safety. In 2014, he applied for a reduction in sentence, no doubt to have some hope of escaping this environment. This was rejected. There have been no recent reports about his time in prison, but I hope it's been horrific and continues to be for the rest of his miserable life. Jamie Cates is a remarkable woman. Rather than letting her own trauma and the loss of her mother in such tragic circumstances destroy her, she has thrived. And I want to play two clips, one from 2014 and the second from 2019, showing how far she's come. October 4th is the five-year anniversary of one of the most heinous crimes ever committed in the state of New Hampshire, the Mont Vernon home invasion. Kimberly Cates and her young daughter were sleeping together when four men broke in, attacking them with knives and a machete. Kim died. Jamie survived. She's 16 now, a junior at Sauhegan High School and a dedicated athlete looking ahead to college. This week, Jamie and her dad, Dave Cates, sat down exclusively with News 9 for a rare interview and opened up about what life is like now. I think we're doing fine, you know. She busts my chops a lot. I bust hers and, um, you know. Bored about me. We're, we're doing fine. I have my license. Hi. Scary. <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> um, I play field hockey currently. I'm going to be doing lacrosse again in the spring. I am studying public health. Um, we are on the home stretch, just about to graduate. I have an internship left. Um, yeah, we're playing field hockey at UNCW. That's fun. I just started that up again. Um, yeah, just living every day like it's the last, right? 21-year-old <laughs> Jamie Cates is an independent, open-hearted college yeah, senior, sharing pictures of her dog Brighton, laughing with friends. An amazing young woman who, at the age of 11, was left for dead, her mother Kimberly murdered, the two attacked with knives and a machete in their Mont Vernon home. The lesson I learned from this 11-year-old girl who'd gone through a terrible thing was it can either hold you back or it can drive you forward. Ten years to the day, the tight-knit community at Amherst Country Club, the ninth annual Kimberly Cates Memorial Golf Tournament, celebrating Kim's legacy, a woman whose happiness and enthusiasm live on in her daughter. We've lost her, but we still have her. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the same characteristics. That <laughs> spirit of compassion and caring that was Kimberly is what has really manifested itself in this scholarship effort. Mm -hmm. This town, the little town, Amherst, Mount Vernon, I mean, honestly, the state even, I wouldn't I, even, I, I think, like, yeah. I, they've, everyone has come together and shown so much support. It's also very important to remember David Cates. He lost his wife, and I imagine, sitting at her bedside for months, believed he was going to lose his daughter as well. I imagine watching Jamie grow up into the amazing woman that she's become has been a source of strength for him. I'm sure that Kimberly would be very proud of both of them. I wish both Jamie and David nothing but peace for the rest of their lives. This section will focus mainly on the profiles of Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble, whilst touching on the psychology of the others involved. So, all roads lead to Spader, so we'll start with him. As part of the court proceedings, his defence had him assessed by a psychiatrist, who stated, quote, I do find evidence of narcissistic personality traits, borderline personality disorder traits, and antisocial slash asocial traits that have previously prompted a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. So on paper, you have a man with a myriad of issues, including narcissism, borderline personality disorder, also known as emotionally unstable personality disorder, and antisocial traits. Whilst it's not stated, I believe it's evident that the severity of this particular disorder 
was such that Steven Spader would be characterised as a psychopath. This would mean that he displayed, amongst other things, deceptiveness, manipulative behaviour, superficial charm, reckless disregard for the welfare of others, and no remorse or guilt for his behaviour. As I've covered many times on this channel, these issues 99% of the time begin in childhood, but with Spader, he's a bit of an enigma. There are no reports of abuse or neglect in the home, and it's stated that his adoptive parents Stephen and Christine Spader tried their very best to raise their son to be a productive member of society. However, I do think the answer does begin in Spader's childhood, but it's unrelated to Stephen and Christine, and instead relates to the fact that he was adopted and how this impacted him. I've read various articles with some appearance to suggest that children who are adopted are more prone to issues with low self-esteem and a fear of rejection than others. However, some authors argue this isn't the case. Personally, I think, like any other issue in childhood, it can affect people in different ways and adoption is the same. I've interviewed people who have been adopted and they have a healthy sense of self and are confident in their connections with others. However, I've also interviewed quite a large number of people who have been adopted and even years later, this has impacted them, including causing them to feel worthless, unlovable, and fearing that those around them would leave them. This is understandable if you think about it. In their minds, for whatever reason, they were rejected by one or both parents, the very people who should love and cherish them. If they were not wanted by their own parents, there must be something wrong with them, and everyone else would inevitably abandon them. This is just a theory. Potentially he was neglected in the family home, or there was some other traumatic incident what is apparent is that whilst he was outwardly a happy little boy, it's clear he was terrified of being rejected, forgotten, and so getting people's attention was everything to him. Initially, he became the class clown, and this appeared to work for him, so he was content. However, when he reached high school, he found his behaviour was actually pushing people away. In his desperation, he began to manipulate and lie to people, just so they were paying the attention he desperately craved, but this pushed people further away. I think this led to Stephen Spader becoming more angry and resentful, and it's likely when he began wanting to hurt other people, those who rejected him. He then thought, fuck it, and started hanging out with people on the fringes of the school hierarchy. These people got the attention he was craving, but it was negative attention. It was fear, but to him, any attention was good attention. However, I think Spader enjoyed creating this sort of emotion in people. Fear was powerful, and he caused this in others. It was far easier to make people scared of him than it was to try to get them to like him. As I've stated in previous videos, at the core of the narcissist is insecurity and fear, as Spader likely, as the years went on, created a false narrative in his head to enable him to cope with how he truly felt about himself. In his case, he began to fantasise about being a gangster, and so he went from being a scared teenager to being some sort of master criminal, and he needed to reinforce this continuously by claiming he'd already killed people and ran with violent street gangs, neither of which seems to be true. As part of his gangster slash outlaw persona, he rejected all rules. They were not made for him. He was a criminal after all, and not just any criminal, a mastermind. This allowed him, in my opinion, to fully embrace his hatred, and it only grew. Fuck society. You rejected me, I'll show you what I'm capable of. You have no idea who you're dealing with. So Spader decided to recruit other young men to his cause, there's an important term used by him in one of the notes he wrote in prison, where he talks about starting a crew. This is a term used to describe groups within the Mafia, and I imagine that Spader had fantasies about being some sort of godfather. I've also read in at least one article, and I'm not sure this is true, that Spader began to idolise mass murderers. And if this is accurate, I think that he, like others that I've covered, saw the power that violence gave to one person. The fact that someone who felt disenfranchised and marginalised could go from a nobody to a name that everyone knew by committing horrific acts of violence. I think these two things came together when Spader was establishing the purpose of his gang. He wanted an organised crime group, but one who specialised in random acts of horrific violence for no other purpose than the thrill of it, for the feeling of power that it would give him. However, the core of this group was his own insecurity, fears and hatred. He wanted men who would not reject him, who he could control and manipulate, who would look up to him, hang on his every word, and who he could direct to kill others because he wanted to burn the world down, the world that had rejected him. His ultimate aim is reflected in the name he chose, the Disciples of Destruction. I think there's another element to Spader, and that is likely neurological. 
He was born with drugs in his system, which makes me think that his mother likely used these throughout her pregnancy, so potentially there was an issue with his brain development. Due to this, it potentially stunted his ability to feel empathy and compassion for others. However, there's no information on this, and I doubt we'll ever know. And so, he went looking for recruits and came across Christopher Gribble. Issues in Gribble's childhood are, in my opinion, much more pronounced. It's clear he was a lonely child who struggled to fit in. I've read that he was diagnosed as having mild traits of autism and this would likely explain his difficulties in picking up on social cues and interacting with others. However, I think the main issue was in the family home. As I said earlier in the video, Gribble has claimed that his mother abused him repeatedly and she has denied this. However, regardless of this, I get a strong sense of neglect in his background. For example, urinating on himself rather than going to the bathroom seems to me like attention-seeking behaviour. If he felt he had to go to that extent to get others to notice him, I think this speaks to how isolated and abandoned he felt. He was obsessed with the military, and I think this was likely part of his fantasy world, and given his later acts, I imagine he was drawn to the violence of the battlefield. Also, he began to abuse animals. This likely gave him a feeling of power when he felt completely powerless, and he likely enjoyed the feeling of hurting another living creature. Whilst he'd apparently not harmed a human being before, he clearly had fantasies about this for years. In court, it was stated that in 2007, two years before the murder, Gribble was also diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, and like Spader, I've little doubt the traits of this condition were severe enough that he could be considered a psychopath. And so, the two of them combined, the marginalised young men, filled with anger, who had fantasies of killing, and who existed on the fringes of society. I imagine that Gribble was elated when he went from a lonely, isolated man to being the second in command, the underboss, in a criminal organisation. I think he fully believed that he too was some sort of gangster, as shown by his ridiculous peacocking in court, claiming to be essentially one of the most dangerous men in prison. William Marks was another insecure young man, and given his poems in prison, he was also clearly full of hate, but with him, it's distinctly directed towards women. I think the draw to him being involved in this incident was because it targeted his agenda that he despised. Orson Savoy was not involved in the actual attack, but the disgusting quip he made when he found out that Jamie was alive I think shows his level of depravity. The group fed off each other. Spader would regale them with his false stories about the other people he'd killed and they would lap it up, and this would embolden them to their own acts of violence. No doubt his little lapdog Gribble would be nodding along, cheering on the boss of the crew. The plan to commit a home invasion and the use of machete, in my opinion, wasn't arbitrary. Our home is our safe space. By targeting a house, the intention was to cause terror in the wider community, to society as a whole, saying to everyone, you're not safe anywhere from the disciples of destruction. The use of a machete was to cause as much violence as possible, to leave a crime scene of horror that would shock anyone who saw it, and to ensure the attack would make the front page of every newspaper with all the gory details. As I said before, I think that the Kate's household had been watched before this incident, and Spader knew who was in there, and the fact that David Cates was away. Potentially a mother and a child were deliberately targeted to add an extra level of horror to the crime, to ensure the most salacious headlines, to get the infamy that he and Gribble were desperate for. The act of murder itself was about power. With each swig of the machete, and every stab wound inflicted by Gribble, they felt a sense of dominance. They were deciding whether Kimberly and Jamie lived or died. Do they expect to get caught? Their calm demeanour when the police showed up leads me to believe they likely considered this as a possibility, but have decided they would try to get away with it. But, if the chips were down, screw it, might as well take credit for our work. If they were not caught, they would commit more murders. If they were caught, they would milk the attention for all it was worth. Win-win. And this is what happened. They got caught, and Spader spent his time combing through news articles, looking for his name and all the details of what he'd done. He bragged to other inmates they needed to know they were in the presence of a hardened criminal, the leader of a crew. He wanted to see the disgust in people's eyes. He wanted to see their fear. He knew full well he was guilty, but he wanted the trial so everyone heard what he'd done. With regards to Gribble, his opportunity to brag about just how dangerous he was was on the stand. Do you not know who I am, who you're dealing with? It does have to be said that I think some of the blame rests on the mental health services. Both the families of Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble begged for help 
but they were ignored. We will never know whether their input would have made a difference. An interesting question, which I want your help with, is why did Stephen Spader refuse the opportunity to be resentenced? The only logical conclusion I can think of is that he actually likes prison. Perhaps he feels he can't cope in the outside world, or potentially he's gained respect in prison. In his mind, perhaps he thought it was best to be a man with status in prison, rather than coming out into the world with nothing, a killer who would be shunned by society for the rest of his life. Regardless, neither Stephen Spader or Christopher Gribble will ever see freedom. If they were released, I have no doubt they would kill again. They are two very dangerous men. So, had you heard about this case before? What are your thoughts? Please leave your comments below. If you like the content, then consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. You can also send a one-off donation to support the channel using the thanks button. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.